Season's greetings. You are listening to the special Christmas edition of This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1191 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Dutch regulators are cracking down on anti-5G devices, while here in the U.S., the FAA voices its concern over the deployment of new 5G transmitters interfering with airplane instrumentation. A new section manager is appointed in Georgia. A club in Georgia donates license manuals to local schools. Switzerland now has its own AMSAT organization. Norway is working on tracking down two-meter intruders in that country. And the NASA solar probe has touched the sun. All this and a lot more is straight ahead on our special Christmas 2021 edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, takes some time to tell us about your modem and router. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, how does your gear measure up? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at the 1974 FCC proposal to totally restructure amateur radio. And we have a special Christmas present for you this year. We will listen to a monologue given by the late Gene Shepard, K2ORS, which he recorded while live on WORAM and FM in New York during the 1960s, which we know you will enjoy. So snuggle up to the fire, pour a glass of eggnog as we first get you up to date on all the latest amateur radio news. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from our ham radio outpost in the Catskill Mountains, where a fat guy in a red suit has bent up my chimney-mounted Yagi last night, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from an eggnog-covered Troy, New York News Bureau, happy holidays, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where winter is still out of town, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. This is George B. W2XBS sitting in for Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, who is away on assignment. Leading off the news this Christmas week, transportation regulators are concerned that a version of 5G that's due to be switched on in January could interfere with some airplane instrumentation, and many aviation industry groups share those fears despite reassurances from federal telecom regulators and wireless carriers. Boeing and Airbus want the Biden administration to delay rollout of 5G cell service, citing safety concerns. Specifically, the Federal Aviation Administration is worried that 5G cellular antennas near some airports, not Air Traveler's mobile devices, could throw off readings from some aircraft equipment designed to tell pilots how far they are from the ground. Those systems, known as radar altimeters, are used throughout a flight and are considered critical equipment. Radar altimeters differ from standard altimeters, which rely on air pressure readings and do not use radio signals to gauge altitude. The agency is so concerned that this month it issued an urgent order forbidding pilots from using the potentially affected altimeters around airports where low visibility conditions would otherwise require them. This new rule could keep planes from getting to some airports in certain circumstances because pilots would be unable to land using instruments alone. It's not entirely clear which airports this rule may affect. When it rolled out the order, the FAA said the exact airports would be specified later once it had more information from wireless carriers about where the 5G infrastructure might be placed. The clock, however, is ticking. On January 5th, Wireless carriers are expected to activate the 5G service that relies on the radio frequencies the FAA is worried about. 
According to a service map by the Federal Communications Commission, big swaths of California, Florida, New England, Texas, and the Midwest will gain 5G coverage next month. But aviation groups warn that it could jeopardize some of the nation's largest airports, including Los Angeles, New York, and Houston. Meanwhile, fearing radioactivity transmissions from 5G mobile network towers, people in the Netherlands may have placed themselves in greater danger by wearing what they believe to be protective devices. The very devices, such as necklaces, bracelets, and sleep masks, that have made claims to shield people from what some fear is radioactivity from 5G mobile network towers, according to Dutch officials, have themselves been emitting ionizing radiation at hazardous levels. A report from the BBC says that the Dutch Authority for Nuclear Safety and Radiation Protection have issued a warning about the products, telling people there could be long-term hazardous effects. The agency has ordered a halt to the sale of those devices. The BBC report quoted the World Health Organization's assertion that, like amateur radio signals, 5G mobile networks make use of non-ionizing radio waves that do not pose a high danger, adding that they are similar to 3G and 4G networks already in use. Some people fear damage to their DNA from such transmissions, and in extreme cases, this has led to attacks on the transmitters and towers themselves. In consultation with ARRL Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB, ARRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, has appointed David Benoist, AG4ZR, to fill the vacant post of ARRL Georgia Section Manager starting immediately. Benoist of Sonoya had previously served in the position from 2016 to 2021. The former Georgia ARRLSM, Jim Millsap, K9APD, resigned for personal reasons effective December 14th after serving since October 1st. Benoist was the ARRL Georgia Section Emergency Coordinator from March 2014 to 2016. The Dalton Amateur Radio Club in Dalton, Georgia has donated copies of the ARRL Ham Radio License Manual to several schools in its service area. The materials will be available in the school's media center. On December 1st, the Dalton Amateur Radio Club President Jack Thompson, N5UOV, met with media specialist Sarah Hicks and Ryan Long of Murray County High School to present both schools with copies of the ARRL Ham Radio License Manual, which covers everything needed to obtain a technician class license, including the full question pool for the exam. During the second presentation on December 3rd, Thompson and David Stanley WI4L met with Whitfield County Schools Media Specialist Gian Bolhus and Communications Specialist Christina Horsley to present 10 copies of the license manual, which will be placed in each middle school and high school in the county. The visits offered Thompson and Stanley a chance to answer questions about amateur radio. Thompson explained to Hicks that not only was ham radio an interesting hobby, it involves public service activities and could inspire students to become involved in emergency management or search and rescue activity. Bolos also asked about the uses of amateur radio. Stanley explained that ham radio is often the last line of communications in an emergency when all others fail. Thompson explained how his activity as a radio amateur led to 25 years of volunteering as a reservist in emergency management and as a member of the search and rescue team of DeSoto County Sheriff's Department in Mississippi. Representatives from all the schools received information about the ARRL Foundation Scholarship Program. The Dalton Amateur Radio Club has expressed its appreciation to Tom Smith, KI4IG, for making the initial contact with the school, and ARRL for providing the manuals at no cost. AMSAT HB is the latest amateur radio satellite organization in the AMSAT fold. AMSAT HB was formed in Switzerland on November 26th. Switzerland's International Amateur Radio Union Member Society, USKA, cited a sharp rise in interest in ham radio satellites in the country, as well as interest in the QO-100 geostationary satellite, amateur radio on the International Space Station, and tracking objects in space. More and more experiments are being carried out with SDR, or software-defined radio technology in these areas, USKA said. But colleges and universities are also increasingly focused on these topics and are looking for help from radio amateurs in Switzerland. 
Amstat DL of Germany, President Peter Gultso, DB2OS, was involved in this project in advance and was one of those to suggest establishing an Amstat organization. When it was founded, Gultso took on the role of godparent and led the founding meeting live from Hanover, Germany. One of AMSAT HB's first decisions was to apply to USKA for collective membership. The website, Swiss AMSAT Operator, has temporarily gone mostly dark while changes are underway to reflect the new AMSAT HB organization. We will announce our goals and purposes on this site and information on how to become an AMSAT HB member, an announcement said. Era currently only has a single class of amateur license, but in a consultation response document released on December the 17th, the Irish regulator Comreg says it will introduce a lower level license. The document, called a response to consultation on Comreg's draft radio spectrum management strategy statement for 2022 to 2024, covers a number of matters relating to the amateur services. You can download the document from www.comreg.ie and the amateur radio related issues are on pages 50 to 57. Comreg said that taking into account the support expressed for entry level or novice licensing and the strong justifications given, Comreg will seek in the timeline of this strategy statement and subject to resources to put in place a framework for novice licensing in Ireland. It's envisaged that to achieve this, Comreg will need to consult on its proposals, make new regulations with the consent of the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications Minister under Section 6 of the Wireless Telegraphy Act 1926 as amended, and tender for an external party to run any examination that may be required. At this time, Comreg would consider if that examination is best offered online and, as a consequence, could be taken at any time. The response document makes use of the terms entry level and novice level as though they were interchangeable, but as far as CEPT is concerned, they mean completely different things, and it is unclear what Comreg are meaning when they use the word novice. CEPT entry level refers to a basic license requiring about 8 to 10 hours of tuition. CEPT novice level is a much higher level license that is equivalent to the USA general or the UK intermediate licenses. Norway's International Amateur Radio Union Member Society, the Norwegian Radio Relay League, is working with the Norwegian Communications Authority to stop intruders from operating on two meters. Unlicensed stations in eastern Norway are operating on 144.200 MHz, 144.300 MHz, and 144.650 MHz. The Norwegian Radio Relay League wants radio amateurs and listeners to listen on those frequencies, log the details of any intruders, and send the logs in to the NRRL. The Amateur Radio on the International Space Station team will support slow scan TV transmissions from the International Space Station December 26th through the 31st. The images will be related to lunar exploration. Transmissions should be available worldwide on 145.800 MHz FM using SSTV mode PD120. Transmissions are set to start on December 26th at about 1825 UTC and end December 31st at about 1705 UTC. The signal should be receivable on a handheld transceiver with a quarter wave whip antenna. Use the widest filter for 25 kHz channel spacing. Participants may post and view images on the ARIS SSTV gallery. The ARIS Slow Scan Television blog has more information. Visit the AMSAT Online Satellite Pass Predictions page for ISS Pass Times. The Yuletide season is upon us, and the Wireless Institute of Australia was one of many amateur radio groups notified by the German regulator through their regulatory committee, alerting them to be aware of radio interference this Christmas. Phil, Victor Kilo 2 Charlie Papa Radio, writes that one unfortunate side effect of the Christmas celebrations is the dumping on our market of cheap devices emitting radio interference. At the moment, USB battery chargers and action cameras are particularly coming to the notice of the German Federal Network Agency, their regulator Bnets A. At first glance, many electrical products are very cheap bargains, but in reality, however, they are inferior products that cause radio interference. 
In recent weeks, Binetze has increasingly found light-emitting diode products of all kinds, but especially Christmas lighting, that do not meet the legal requirements. The spectrum ranges from simple LED lamps to LED recessed and ceiling lights, and to outdoor lighting such as LED floodlights. Colour changing and other Christmas lighting for indoors and outdoors are also popular items to buy in the run-up to Christmas. The prices of these products are usually significantly lower than those well-known brand products, especially in online retail. This can be an indication of inferiority and undercutting of legal requirements when it comes to radio frequency interference. The CAMSAT XW3 CAS9 amateur radio satellite has been installed on the CZ4 CY39 launch vehicle at the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in China and related work is in progress as planned. CAMSAT's Alan Kong, BA1DU, reports. If all goes well, the satellite will be launched on Christmas, December 25th, 2021. The orbit will be a circular sun-synchronous orbit with an altitude of 770 kilometers. The XW3CAS9 user manual has more details. The 100 milliwatt linear transponder will have an uplink frequency of 145.870 MHz and a downlink frequency of 435.180 MHz. The transponder passband is 30 kHz inverted. The satellite will have a CW beacon on 435.575 MHz. The National Amateur Radio Society of Finland, SRAL, has presented Iceland's National Society, the IRA, with an engraved Morse key to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the IRA's foundation. Eric, Oscar Hotel 2 Lima Alpha Kilo, presented IRA Chair Jonas Tango Foxtrot 3 Juliet Bravo with a gift from their sister organisation in Finland. The gift was received in a ceremony on the 16th of December. The gift is an engraved KBX380 Morse paddle key made by a well-known Finnish radio amateur, Tapio, Oscar Hotel 1, Kilo Bravo. The gift was accompanied by a letter from the Secretary General of SARL, Marka, Oscar Hotel 4, Uniform India, in which he extended sincere greetings to Icelandic radio amateurs on their 75th anniversary. On behalf of all Finnish radio amateurs, he congratulated their dear friends in Iceland. Marker said that Icelanders have a special place in Finland's heart, and when they meet, they immediately find a connection, courage, independence, and perhaps a little stubbornness, along with a good sense of humour, are qualities that unite the two nations. As the pandemic now prevents them from having a more substantial event, they could only hope to meet soon, to celebrate together in a larger group. Marker wished their Icelandic friends all the best, many good contacts, and excellent telecommunications conditions. The IRA chair thanked Eric for his warm greetings and said that he accepted the gift on behalf of the association with pleasure and thanked the kind recognition of the society members in Finland to the members of the IRA. You can read more at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Iceland. Season's greetings. This is W2XBS. I would like to take a moment to wish all of our affiliates and listeners across the country and around the world all of the best of the holiday season. And as our present to you, please sit back and enjoy one of the nation's best storytellers talk about being a kid and getting on amateur radio. Now, for your enjoyment, here is Gene Shepard, the late K2ORS, as heard on one of his broadcasts on WOR Radio in New York during the mid-1960s. Time for Gene Shepard, author, raconteur, and commentator on the contemporary scene. Here's Gene. Uh, I remember very cleanly and distinctly the, the excitement that Friday night meant. It's a fantastic, it, it always will. Uh, even to guys who are not in school, who are still not 15, uh, Friday night is a special, peculiar kind of a dangerous night. And what it meant to me... I have, to, I have to admit one terrible thing uh, at, at one point in my life. What it really meant to me was Friday night was the one night that I could keep my ham station going until dawn. I did not have to get up early in the next morning. Even my paper route did not work uh, early morning Saturday. The paper was not delivered on Saturday morning. I made my collections Saturday afternoon, 
but I could stay up all night, and I would come. I'd come home from a date, you know, the whole scene. I'd have the, I'd have the whole bit going, and about. About 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, I'm with this girl. We're having a malt, you know. We're sitting in the drive-in watching Charlie Chan or some other big uh, opus of the period. I'm, uh, I can hardly wait, you know. I keep hearing it in my mind. I keep hearing the CQs on 40. I said, oh, boy, that must be. Gee, right now, about now, the West Coast must be coming in. Right about now, the, the W6s are starting to pound into the 9th District. And here I am sitting with uh, Esther Jane, you know. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, Esther Jacob saying, gee, what a, a penny for your thoughts. And I'd say, yeah, well, a penny for my thoughts. What was, what'd you say, what, what? She'd say, a penny for your thoughts. And I'd think for a minute, and I'd say, shall I tell her about that pie section network I was thinking of in my mind? This pie section network, I got a terrific idea to change the standing wave ratio on my 600 ohm feed on my 40... My 40 meters up. Shall I tell her about that? And then it would come out, you know, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, okay. And I'd say, you know, Esther, what I was thinking of, that, uh, that there is in the handbook, in the ARRL handbook, there's a terrific section on Pi Section Networks. And I wonder if you'd like to go home with me and the two of us will build a Pi Section Network that will reduce the standing wave ratio on the 600 ohm feeds to my 40 meter and by that time, I'd see her drifting away. And she'd be looking out of the front window of the car now, and she's watching Charlie Chan again. I'd say, what's the matter? What's the matter? Just think of the fun we could have together. You, you could hold the solder, and I could take the soldering iron. And I'd say, give me the solder. Quick, 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 quick. Come on. Now put a plier down there. Hold it on that, on that terminal. Oh, boy, would we have fun. And it'd be this long, pregnant silence. And I recognized that, once again, I had mighty Casey had struck out. And, and I could not, I, I knew then there were certain things that you just didn't talk to chicks about. Pi section networks, you do not discuss mercury switching systems with chicks. You do not discuss a class C final with a chick. And <laughs> you, don't, you don't even discuss the, the ineffable mysteries of the universe of that kind with a girl. And I remember one period I was, I was plunged into a profound funk, a real funk, and Oddly enough, just the other night, I'm looking in the newspaper, I'm sitting there, and I'm down at the Horn and Hard Arts, you know, and I got my egg cup in front of me and a big cup of Horn and Hard Arts coffee, and I'm just casually going through the paper. And it was a paper that I found there. It was, it was on, somebody's, on somebody's table. I'm just going through it. And suddenly, Skip, a name hit me. A name just stuck right out of the headlines there. Now, you, we're used to big, you know, regular names like President Johnson, Dean Rusk, and Charles de Gaulle, Mickey Mantle and stuff. It was a name? I says, no, it can't be. It can't be. And it was an obituary. And sure enough, there it was, the name of a man who probably nobody in the entire Horn and Hard Art, probably, I would say, anybody on 6th Avenue at that moment, sitting in coffee shops, sitting in H&Hs, and sitting in Bickfords, wherever they might be, if I ran from one of those tables to the other and says, look, look, Look who died. Look at the name. Do you remember the name? The name would mean nothing to them. To how many of you does the name Heising mean anything? Did you ever hear of Heising modulation? Heising modulation. You know, there aren't many men in, in any field who give their name to an entire system or an entire uh, formula or a new discovery. You know, like the Salk vaccine. We all know the Salk vaccine. Uh, Dr. Salk's name will be familiar and will be famous for, for generations, the name Salk vaccine. We know about Freud, you know, the, the Freud dream analysis ideas and, and Dr. Freud's hypotheses and so on. We know about Einstein's theory of relativity. Well, Heising lived over here in Jersey. He died just a, just a couple of days ago. And I caught the name, and it was connected with one of the peculiar, long, blue funk moments I've ever had in my life. The Heising system of modulation is a system of AM amplitude modulation. Now, you're listening to me in most likelihood, if you're listening to 710 on your dial, I know you are, you're listening to amplitude modulation. That's AM radio. Uh, the other kind of radio is connected with another man. That's the FM radio. What's the name of the man? 
uh, really who was generally credited as being uh, being the genuine developer of FM radio. Come on, who is it? Uh, what kind of an engineer are you for crying out? You know who it is. Why he was uh, there? Isn't that sad? The great men of our time hardly any, Major Armstrong. Oh, for heaven's sakes! He also was uh, involved in the in the superheterodyne theories. That's another thing. There was a great man. But the name Heising, it had became so mystical, so involved in my life, like a coal pits oscillator, for example. I wonder, I wonder if old man coal pits, who invented a certain type of oscillator, knew that for, for years and years and years there would be a little diagram in uh, question and answer manuals, in ARL handbooks that would say coal pits oscillator. Now, now, I, I'm not talking to you about radio here, so don't get bored here. I'm talking to you about something else. Can you imagine your name, let's say Witherspoon or uh, Aschenschlager? Let's say if, if, if there were textbooks to be printed for 100 years from that, and it would say Aschenschlager's Law of Rottenness. And forever and ever, people would know the name Aschenschlager, and it's, it's not even a, a man anymore. It's, it's just a name. It's a name. Heising was not a man to me. And I was astounded to find a Mr. Heising died. And I read the obit, and it was the one. It really was the Heising who had created this system of modulation. Well, let me tell you, uh, speaking, speaking of bad modulation, this is WOR AM and FM New York. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to go into a technical description of what the Heising system of modulation is. I could go into that. That's for next semester. Uh, we won't do that tonight, but I will, I will tell you this, that I am now on CW. See, I'm a kid. I'm about 14 years old. I'm a ham. And my whole life is, is connected with this stuff. And, and, of course, I was also involved in other things, like I'm playing football and I'm playing second base and, and I'm going out with Esther Jane Alberry and I'm going out with Don Strickland and I've got all the chicks going. You know, the whole scene is a gigantic fruitcake of existence. And connected with all of it, of course, and somehow weaving through it in, in this tapestry was this thing of back home in the front bedroom, my shack. And this was my special place, my shack. And the day bed is over here, and the, the windows are over here. And the shack was a, was a bedroom we did not use. It was my shack. And I had this old table that I had bought from the Salvation Army for a dollar. And I'd cleaned it, and I'd put formica on the top of it and polished it. I had a little vice on the side of it, you know. And I had, I had the desk drawers all cleaned out, and I had compartments in there where I had resistors and condensers, and I had all the whole thing. I had a clipboard off to the left where I kept my log sheets and, and my plate readings and my grid drive readings and all that. And I had a rack. I had a four-and-a-half-foot rack that I bought. I bought it in an old used radio store, a place where you buy old radio junk, you know. And I bought this rack. It was a big four and a half foot rack, and it had big 19, 19 and a half inch panels across it. And in it, this big four and a half foot rack, which is a great big piece of iron, I had a 10 watt transmitter. <laughs> that was the joy, the light of my life. It was CW, and every night uh, when all the other kids, you know, were sort of just hanging around the living room and walking around picking their teeth and crying and whining and looking out of the window. And, and the yelling down the hot air register, you know, stuff that kids do. I would be in the front bedroom in my shack with my key. The time that Uncle Tom gave me that key, I will for, forever remember. He gave me an old railroad, beautiful railroad key with a side winder, you know, a real key, see. And I would be down there at uh, maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and I'm on there with my cans, my Brandy's earphones hanging on my head, and I'm on 40 meters. My 6L6 is laying it down on 40, and I'm right there in the middle of the band. 7182 was my Bliley X-Cut crystal. And I am number one on 7182. And my, my rig had such poor voltage regulation, Skip, that the entire house, when I would press the key down, the lights would go, and about every 10 minutes, my old man was, would come back. Well, you cut out that. I can't even read now already. I'd say, okay, Dad, all right. I'd sit there and then I'd go, wait for a couple of minutes. I'd wait till, you know, you always wait till the ripples sort of die down. And the, the talk builds up again out there. And then I go, do, 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 do. A few little V's, you know. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. 
I am laying it out on 40. So this is my whole life. I walk around the streets with, with Esther Jane or with Helen Weathers or with uh, Dorothy, or one of the chicks I was going with, and I would hear a horn. A car would go past, you see. And uh, I'd hear that old horn blow. You always hear this. If you're, if you're a real CW man, you hear it, and you can never get rid of it. You hear it all the time. I stand next to subway trains right now on 59th Street, and they come along, you know, and I hear the doors rattling and everything, and I hear them. They say things. In coach, he goes past roaring out of CQ, you know. It's the double A train. I can hear a CQ just as quiet, just as plain and easy. You know? I'm walking down the street with Helen Weathers or with Dorothy Anderson, and I hear the horns. You know, the horn goes. Some guy sends a K. I turn around and go. And there's a dull silence. There. And then I'd hear obscenities. I'd, I'd walk along and somebody would send, send an obvious obscenity. He doesn't know he's doing it, you know. He just said, ba 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 I dig Dorothy. I said, did you hear what he said? She, she said, what? And, of course, the word got out that I was kind of a nut. You know, kids who do things that all other kids don't do are always, always kind of looked upon as the nut, the crowd. Well, about that time, it was maybe about a year after I got on CW, and uh, I was going up for my Class A examination. Now, this is a special exam that you take that involves amplitude modulation. It's about telephone, radio telephone, this whole business that we're involved in right now. Right now, you and I, you're, you're listening to me on a, on a radio set. I'm talking to you on an amplitude modulation transmitter and so forth. Well, that was that whole theory, diagrams and the whole business. And there was one special section called the theory, the adjustment and the maintenance of the Heising modulation system. And I got involved in that. Somehow I, I began to dig this system. I liked to, it had a nice had a nice symmetry about its diagrams. It was a nice somehow I dug the theory of the Heising system. <laughs> Don't ask me why, I can tell you now. One thing, it's cheaper than most other systems. And, and, and I began to dig this Heising modulation system. And then I began to go down to, uh, to the old surplus radio stores, and I began to look for chokes, filter chokes and stuff that I could build, I could use to make this Heising system. And it became almost the next big goal. You know, as we all live in our lives, uh, whatever little life we have, we have goals achieved and goals about to be achieved, and we have goals we're aiming at all the time. So a guy may live uh, during a certain period in his life and his, his idea is get a boat, get a boat. And he walks around the street and he thinks about boat, 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 boat. Or, or he, he, he may have this thing, uh, uh, get a promotion, uh, get to be the uh, chief clerk, get, uh, get to be the chief clerk. And he thinks about this all the time, get to be the chief clerk. Other guys have the thing, yeah, I'm going to make money on the AT&T. I'm going to make, I'm going to make dough. You see, the, the reason we, we dig horse racing uh, and, and, and the stock market and that kind of thing is because you can see goals achieved and also goals failed. That's part of it. And so our, each life, each day is a whole series of little goals. Uh, gee, if I can only get away to get a, get a cup of coffee. Holy smokes, if I can only get away to get a cup of coffee. Oh, wow, wow. And you go for about a half an hour, so you're working away there, and then all of a sudden you say, I'm going to go. I'm going to go and get a cup of coffee. And boom, the next thing you know, you're sitting down there at that good old chock full of nuts, and the coffee's out there, and a goal has been achieved. A goal has been achieved. Bing, it's big, you know. It's there, you see. And there I was beginning to develop this thing, and heising modulation. Now, I know <laughs> this means nothing to you, but millions of hams are listening and they're saying, yeah, man, yeah. Well, at that same time, there was a girl that I was really hung up on. I don't even remember this girl's name. It was one of those brief, momentary things, you know, where you get hung up on a chick. I remember she had dark hair and she had sort of pink, light-type skin. And I remember she lived on the north side of town. And I remember I used to ride over there about every second day with my Elgin bicycle, like mad through the gloam, just to look at her house, you know, that kind of thing. Just to ride past her house once in a while, like, hey, ah, look out! She'd never look out. But once in a great while, I'd see her at the tennis court, that kind of thing. I had a big hang-up on this chick. And at the same time, I had a hang-up on Heising modulation. Well, one day, I'm in this store, this old junky store that we used to go to. Uh, I'm, I'm down in the Ace Radio Shop. It's a crummy old, lousy radio shop. They have millions of piled up turntables of old 
uh, disreputable types, you know, wound for Bulgarian capitals, special types of winding that only work on six and a half volts or some nutty thing like that, or 18 and a third volts, all kinds of crazy equipment. And I came across the, the transformer. It was perfect for my Heising modulation. Well, I had about a dollar. That was about as much as I could go. And old Sam, back at the counter there, at the, at the Ace Radio Shop, is looking me right in the eye, and he says, A buck, are you kidding? Do you realize it's a 300 mil transformer? What are you talking about, Mac? You don't find many of them anymore. That's a 300 mil Ford Darson transformer. And I... There I'm there, confronted with it. Well, that night, I had a date. I had one dollar. This son of a gun wanted two and a half for this transformer. Now, I had a total, probably a total stake at the time, of about three bucks, of which one dollar was to go for a transformer that day, or something else. Maybe I wanted to buy it. Whatever I was going to get was going to be a buck, see. I figured two bucks, well, we'll go down to the Orpheum, me and this chick, and it'll leave us uh, enough to get a hamburger over at Minor and Dunn's. And, uh, well, you know, it'll work out pretty good. I'll maybe squeak by with an extra quarter or two. I had it all figured out. Well, Sam looked me in the eye. I looked Sam in the eye. And right there on that counter in front of us, it was laying right there. Now, this is the curse that all men have had to face all the time. All men I know. Is it going to be a boat? Or... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. I don't think chicks have these kind of decisions to make quite as often as men. They may in the future. But men always have these little things, you know. They do. They have to decide whether or not to be a social animal or a rotten, crummy, selfish animal. Now, usually they, do, they devise it in such a way in their mind to be both. And so the guy will say, well, if I buy this transformer, I will be a happier person to be with. Not only that, I will, be, I will be more fulfilled. And then I could certainly be able to fulfill my role with Esmeralda much. But actually, I'm, I'm investing in her, if you look at it in a certain way. If you look at it a certain way, in a certain light, that the best thing I could do for her would be to buy this 300 mil Thor Darson transformer and build up my Heising modulation system, and from there on in it would be hotsy totsy. That's, well, that's the way my mind went. So, five minutes later, I am going home with this big transformer under my, oh, that excitement, you know, I had all the other stuff, you know, I was all ready to go. And that afternoon, I'm building and soldering, getting this thing going, you know, I got, a, I got the diagrams out, and I'm working down the circuit, the circuit values, and I've, I've, you know, I'm hinching a little bit, you know, I got a couple of things where it says 0.2 micro microfarad condenser, I got a 0.1, you know, little things like that all the way down, yeah, go free, I'll make it work, you know, the, the, the resistor that it should have been, let's say, 1,500 ohms, I had one that was 2,700 ohms, uh, you know, that's, that's close enough for jazz, you know, <laughs> so well, anyway, it's now about 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, there, thereabouts, and I have built my first modulator. I don't know whether you know the excitement, friends. I, I don't know how I can transmit this to you. Of going on the air for the first time on your transmitter. Now, I'm not talking about CB. This is nothing. This is kid stuff. Come on. None of that junk. And, and by the way, many people today confuse amateurs for CBers. They're totally different animals. Completely. There is no parallel between. Uh, a CBer bears about the same relationship to an amateur as a little grandmother riding along the West Side Highway in her 47 Plymouth bears to Sterling Moss. <laughs> it's about the same, isn't it? Roughly, yeah. They ain't at all the same thing. Don't confuse them at all. And so I, I, I'm, I've got this Heising modulation system all done. I've got a 6L6 tube in the final. i got a dummy load on it. And I'm all set to try it out, test the whole thing out. i got the microphone. i got a, a single-button carbon mic. Put the gain on, turn it all on. And then I, I stand back with the mic, and I'm ready to go. And I've got my... I, I was using to test my modulation system. I have a 2-watt neon bulb, which I could see. <laughs> it was about as close. And, of course, I had a milliammeter. I had an ammeter in the, in the plate and so on. And so she's heating up. Slowly, I apply the plate voltage. I had a variac, and I'm applying the plate voltage to my final. She's now up to 700 volts. 
a lot of voltage on that poor old 6L6. And she's a bright, brisk, cherry red, you know. And I said, well, maybe I'll back it down a little bit. I go down a couple of notches. And I'm now I got about 500 volts on the plate. And then I switch in my Heising modulation. And there's one moment, just a moment of pause, when suddenly, without any warning, it goes... I get this fantastic chatter in my transformer. I back it down. I look at it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I turn off the switches. Get off the diagram. I'm checking it over here. Check, check, check. check. Everything checks out. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see here. Well, maybe I had just too much gain on the input there. Maybe she was overloading, motorboating. That's it. She's probably motorboating. So I turn it on again. I stand back and wait. And everything in my, my 6L6s glow, this nice cherry glow. And I turn up the gain a little bit. Hello, hello. One, two, three, four. Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, hello. Ooh, for crying out loud. I back it down a little bit. Hello. Hello. By the way, Mr. Heising was doing this to me, in case you don't know it. The man who just passed into the great beyond over in Jersey. Hello. 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 And it was the first time that I'd ever encountered one of the major curses of mankind. Downward modulation. Now, that means nothing to your friends. <laughs> Except, suffice it to say, that when old Shep talks to you here, uh, the the uh, transmitted signal of WOR goes up. As my voice goes up, the transmitter, the signal goes up. Well, my transmitter was working the opposite. As I would talk into it, it would go down. <laughs> and I'm holding the thing up there. Hello, 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 hello. And now it's getting about 7 o'clock, see. Hello, hello, one, two, three, four. Oh, what a curse. And I could not get... And, and by that time, I decided, well, there must be something wrong. I'm not checking it right, so I'll call CQ. Hello, CQ, hello, CQ, hello, CQ, hello, CQ. And I'm tuning back. Hello, I'm on 160, in case you're interested in the band. Hello, CQ, hello. And I stand by. And immediately, a guy comes back right on the frequency. Gong! W9QWN, W9QWN. Oh, no. Fantastic signal. W9QWN, W9QWN. This is W9XXX standing by. Do you hear me, old man? Oh, <laughs> oh uh, W9XXX. Yeah, this is W9QWN here. You're uh, Q5R9 plus here, old man. I handle here a Shep, S H E P. Shep. Handle here a Shep. We're running a single 6L6. Uh, about uh, 10 watts, uh, Heising modulation, uh, modulated by a single 10, uh, by a single 6L6 here, and a single button carbon mic. I'm using a 40 meter zip on the carbon attic tomorrow. Okay, W9XXX, uh, W9QWN uh, standing by. Kunk. Kunk. That signal comes back. W9QWN, this is W9XXX uh, here. I recognized him as one of the great famous hams of the area. You know, it's like talking. It's like if you're an aviation nut and all of a sudden you're hooked up with Lindbergh. You know, and you're down at the flying club and you two are discussing flying together. You know. And he comes back to me and he says, uh, What did you say the uh, handle was? I don't remember working you before. I just thought I'd call you. You're messing up the band. Uh, you're you're lousing up the frequency here. It sounds to me like you've got a little downward modulation, and I don't think you're final. It, it sounds a little bit like you're a lot of parasitics there. And uh, not only that, it sounds to me just a little bit like your neutralization is way off, man. I just thought I'd call you. I didn't want to get involved in any long rag chew. Uh, you better look into it, old man. And uh, I'm going to QR, QRT now. I think I'll pull a switch, and uh, don't bother to come back. You sound rotten. Uh, don't bother. Come back, old man. Uh, it's all right, fellow. Uh, your signal here is about, I'd say, around a Q3, Q2 to 3, about an R2. Well, that meant that he had to turn up everything he had just to hear me. And when he did turn it up to hear me, I was just rotten. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> he just, goom, he's gone. I'm sitting. Icing modulation, eh? Yeah. Turn it on again, I take my neon bulb. This time I put the I put the, the dummy load in. See, I'm not going to radiate all over the band and I get on there. Hello, hello. It keeps flickering downward. It's now 8.30. Quarter to nine. My check has been waiting for me since seven. It's at seven o'clock. Well, I finally realize, you know, this is, this is, this is, this is, this way lies madness. In this way lies the antisocial animal. And uh, once you have committed yourself to the antisocial animal forever, you'll be down in some dank basement, 
surrounded by half-empty ball jars full of nails. The rest of your life will be given over to this insanity, whatever it is. I knew that even then, as an animal. I knew even then that hang-ups can devour you. And so, about quarter to nine, I looked at this thing, I said, oh, okay, I turned it off. And 15 minutes later, I am picking up this chick. And 10 minutes after that, we are on our way to the Aragon. We are on our way to <laughs> this place where they had these terrible bands and stuff, see? And all the way on up, all I could think of was downward modulation. All I could think of it was like I had failed as a man. <laughs> I wonder, uh, it's too bad that Tennessee Williams doesn't write plays about the things that really get guys going, that really get guys hung up. I have known guys for two solid years, two solid years to be eaten up inside. I mean eaten up where they yell at their chicks, they threaten to kill their daughters, they, they, they take a shot at their boss because of one thing, they get rotten gas mileage. They're getting eight miles to the gallon, and it burns them up every time they go into that gas station. You know, they bought this monster, and it takes 14 gallons of gas just to get the town and back. <gasps> it's like, it's like uh, Ahab and that, and that whale, you know? And so we are on our way to the Aragon Ballroom. Well, have you ever danced with a chick? when you've got a heising system of modulation on your mind with downward modulation and also a bad problem with the par parasitics. All the time I'm hearing parasitics in my mind. You know, parasitics are awful things. They're like little, uh, well, when you hear parasitics on the air, you know it. It's like a swarm of awful, angry, sort of somehow debauched, erotic locusts. They surround your signal. It's a fuzzy signal. If you could tune past WOR and it sounds like a, like a shaving brush that's been drinking, uh, that would be like my signal was on 160, and I'm bugged. Well, on the way home, after about uh, says, m at least uh, four hours of dancing, it seemed like four hours, went on endlessly, back and forth, we're going. We we're on our way home, and she turned to me, and she says, I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I said, what, 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 what? I, I, already, you see, I was back in, in, in my shack. You know, I was sitting next to this chick on the Western Avenue car, but I'm already back in the shack, you know, and I've, I've got an idea. I'll tell you what it is. It must be the cathode. It must be my cathode biases. That's it, that's it. I, I, you know, I'm thinking, oh, oh boy, I can hardly wait to get home. Hardly wait to get home. I'm gonna change that resistor in there. I know what it is, it's really, I know what it is. I know, oh, oh, what a fool, what a nut. And she says, uh, now, come on. She says, you, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're one of the, you're one of the worst people that I've ever dated. I said, what? <laughs> um, you know, I don't make passes or anything. I'm a nice guy, you know. I took her out there. She said, you're one of the worst people I've ever dated. And she says, not only that, she says, but I think, I think that your mother ought to take you to a doctor. I think you're unhealthy. Unhealthy? It never occurred to me to be having a hang-up on a cathode follower circuit or having a hang-up on Heising modulation was somehow a perversion. It was a sickness. I said, well, unhealthy. I don't mean I play football and all that stuff. What do you mean unhealthy? Now I'm getting a little bug with her. What do you mean unhealthy? Anybody with the kind of skin you got should holler about unhealthy for crying out loud. She says, well, I don't care. She's bugged. Oh, a woman scorned even at the age of 14 is, is hell on wheels. That's all I got to say. So I'm saying, well, what do you mean unhealthy? She says, well, I don't think you even talked to me once tonight. I said, what do you mean talk to you? Didn't I buy you an orange drink? I bought you knee-high. I talk. I said, I asked you if you wanted another one. I remember that. I said, it was fun. I remember telling you it was fun. She said, you did not talk to me once. All the time we were at the Erica. Long pregnant pause. I said, what am I going to talk to you? What, do you know anything about downward modulation? She says, what? I said, well, I've got worries. I'm worried. Can't you tell I'm worried? <laughs> Nothing is worried, more worried than a guy who is building something and it hasn't worked. I can tell you this, it drives you out of your skull. I said, I'm worried. And we rode all the way home on the Western Avenue car in silence. Got to the end of the line, took her home, says goodbye. Just goodbye. That was the end of that. I took off like a...
big speckled bird. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think of her. Eight seconds off, I'm ooh, over the privet hedges I'm going, you know. I'm flying all the way home with my wings going, you know. Wow. Woo, up the front porch. Boom, in. Pow, into the front bedroom. Goom, goom, goom. The switches are going on. The old man sitting out in the front room there listening to the A&P Gypsies or something, you know. And I got, I got all the switches turned on, everything going, waiting for it to heat up. I got the soldering iron heating up, and I've got the solder out there. And I have got that two micro micro farad condenser, which I should have put in in the very beginning in the cathode. It hit me halfway through red sails in the sunset. What the problem was? Halfway through, I just, I, what, what's the matter with me? I got a, I got a one tenth condenser in there. It should have been a two, at least a two micro micro farad. I'm soldering this thing up, you know. Boy, I heat this baby out. There, I got the microphone going. Dummy load. All right, let's see. Putting in a little grid drive there. Now she's, oh boy, she's doing real good. Oh, boop, ah. I tune the final plate. Ooh, what a dip. I'm tuning that final tank now. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Advance the gain a little bit. Hello, one, two. Oh, what a beautiful sight. What a beautiful sight. My milliameter in the final plate is ticking up. Ever so slightly. Ding, 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 ding. Up, she's, she's working perfectly. I take my neon bulb. Hello, one, two, three, four. Hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. hello, hello. One, two, three, four. Hello. Beautiful envelope. Magnificent signal. Pow. Out comes the dummy load. In goes my 600 ohm Zep V. Boom, boom. I'm tuning her up on that. Up to the full 10 watts. Hello, 160. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Look at that meter flicking up in there now. Look at it right behind your head, Skip. Look at that beautiful sight. Hello, hello. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Calling CQ. I sat there until I was red in the face calling CQ. This is W9QWN calling CQ and listening. I developed that real snotty way, you know. And listening. Come in there. Boom. I'd wait. Of course, the band was one solid massive heterodynes. I could hear nothing. Just whoo, all the big timers are coming in. It's late at night. And then finally, about one o'clock in the morning, I hear this guy calling, hello, W9QWN, W9QWN. This is W8LFD in Cleveland, Ohio, calling, hello, 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 W9. Oh, fantastic moment of total joy. You know how the guys who have reached the top of Mount Everest feel? I know that feeling. I know that feeling of standing on the top of a glacier, looking out over the Himalayas. Nothing but achievement. You can't go anywhere after this. There I sat that night, working guys all over the Midwest with my 10-watt Heising system of modulation. And it wasn't until there was a postscript to this. Years later, I am out of the Army. Years later. Oh, boy. Long time afterwards. I am going through a department store. I am home about a week and a half, and I still got my uniform on. And I'm going through a department store in Chicago, and who do I meet but that girl? That same girl. And she's working in one of the big stores. In fact, she was working in Carson, in case you're interested. And there she is. And I couldn't remember the chick's name. And she couldn't remember my name. And she was behind a counter. And we both stood there, and I said, say... Ham and High. Didn't you go to Ham and High? She says, yes, of course, you, uh, I remember you. I said, I remember you. Do you remember the, she says, yes, the Aragon. We stood there for a second. And then she finally says, you know, you were kind of a nut. Did your mother ever take you to the doctor or something? See about that? I said, no, no, that, that problem's all cleared up now. It's all cleared up. Little did she know, little did she know that the problem was all cleared up. I was getting upward modulation. You have been listening to Gene Shepard, the late K2ORS, as heard on WOR Radio in New York. Happy holidays from all of us here at This Week in Amateur Radio. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. 
1974, the amateur radio population was on the increase again, thanks to the popularity of 2-meter FM. Incentive licensing had been in place for five years, and the anger and resentment over losing HF frequencies was beginning to fade. However, trouble was brewing. The FCC had several petitions on their agenda, mostly from hams, and one from the Electronics Industry Association. In late 1974, two bombshells were dropped. The first surprise was docket number 20282, the FCC's restructuring plan for amateur radio. Apparently oblivious to the upheaval that was caused in the 1960s with incentive licensing, the FCC was now proposing rules that would take away major privileges from generals, eliminate the ability of 90% of technicians to renew their license, and horror of horrors, create a new no-code license. The proposal was somewhat complicated, so grab a pencil and some paper and follow along. The FCC, in essence, wanted to create a dual ladder incentive licensing system with two routes available. The first, named Series A, covered the shortwave frequencies, while Series B encompassed the VHF UHF allocations. The dividing line between Series A and Series B was not 50 MHz as one would expect, but rather 29 MHz, or roughly in the middle of the 10 meter band. Series A contained the familiar amateur classes, novice, general, advanced, and extra. Novices would get a power increase from 75 to 250 watts input, and would also gain a five-year renewable license to replace the two-year non-renewable one now in existence. Generals would lose big. They would lose the 29.0 to 29.7 megahertz segment of 10 meters. They would be limited to A1, CW, A3, AM and sideband, and F3, FM emissions only. In other words, no more slow scan TV, RIDI, or radio control. Power output would be reduced to 500 watts PEP, and they could no longer supervise mail examinations. Furthermore, they could no longer be the trustee of a club station or repeater. Generals who were already licensed if or when this proposal was adopted would be grandfathered into the Series B technician class license. The advanced class gained under Series A. They kept all of their privileges below 29 megahertz, received a power increase to 2 kilowatts PEP output, gained access to the extra class phone segments, and would be grandfathered into the new experimenter class in Series B. The extra class lost their exclusive phone bands, which would be shared with the advanced license. However, they kept their CW subbands and gained the 2 kilowatt PEP output as well as a lifetime operator license. Notice that the conditional class license is not mentioned. That's because the FCC incorporated into the general license. Conditionals would have the letter C after the word general and their license would not be renewable. On the Series B or VHF UHF side, the proposed changes were even more drastic. The FCC for the entry level license would create a new no code communicator class which would allow operations above 144 megahertz using F3 FM emissions only. Technicians would gain some frequencies the 50.0 to 50.1 and 144 through 145 megahertz segments, but otherwise, like generals, would lose big. They could only use A1, A3, and F3 emissions with 500 watts PEP output and could not be the trustee of a club station or repeater. However, the worst news for technician was that those who had taken their exam via mail, or about 90%, would not be allowed to renew. They, like the conditionals, would have to pass the test again before their license expired. One step above the technician class was another new license proposed by the FCC, the experimenter class. Experimenters would have all amateur privileges above 29 megahertz with a 2 kilowatt PEP output. Above the experimenter license was the extra class, which held the distinction of being the top of the ladder for both Series A and Series B. The FCC proposed adjusting the written exams to accommodate the different requirements of Series A and Series B. Element 2, the old novice written exam, 
would be rewritten into 2A for novice and 2B for communicator. Novices would have to pass the five words per minute code as well as 2A, while communicators only had to pass 2B. Likewise, the general element 3 would be divided into 3A general and 3B technician. Generals and technicians would still have to pass the 13 and 5 words per minute code test respectively. Advanced class operators needed 13 words per minute and the element 4A written exam, while experimenters had to pass a 5 words per minute code test along with element 4B. For the advanced and experimenter classes, only the 20 words per minute code test was needed to upgrade to extra. Since, except for the extra, the Series A and Series B licenses did not overlap, the FCC would allow amateurs to hold one license in each series. This created some interesting possibilities. As previously noted, a general could also hold a technician and an advanced, the experimenter. Both the technicians and experimenters could obtain a novice if they passed element 2A. The no-code communicator could also hold a novice if element 2A in the five words per minute code test was passed. The FCC set a June 1975 deadline for comments on the restructuring proposal. The ARRL, still smarting from incentive licensing conflicts, wasn't going to comment until they had taken the pulse of their members. What was the ARRL's response? And just what was the Class ECB, the other FCC proposal? How did it affect amateur radio? In our next installment, the Ancient Amateur Archives will have the answers. The British Antarctic Territory, the BAT, is administered from London by the Polar Regions Department of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. They recently announced plans to administer an amateur radio license for the territory. Note that no license has been available there for the past two years. A surprising feature of the proposal is the amateur bands they plan to allocate. It would have been expected that they would copy the amateur frequency schedule issued by the Falkland Islands Communications Regulator, who administered amateur radio licensing in the British Antarctic Territory prior to 2019. But instead, the Foreign Office have excluded many of the amateur and amateur satellite service allocations. For comparison, a list of the Falkland Islands amateur allocations can be viewed at www.regulatorfi.org.fk. Just go to the Spectrum section. Inexorably, the Foreign Office proposal for the British Antarctic Territory excludes a part of the 24 GHz band and also the entire amateur and amateur satellite service allocations at 2.4, 5, 10, 47, 76 GHz and above. You can see the allocations proposed by the UK Foreign Office at BritishAntarcticTerritory.org.uk. In contrast, Germany permits the use of these bands at their nearby Neuermeyer 3 Antarctic Research Station. For example, the 2.4 and 10 GHz bands are used extensively by amateurs for contacts via the QO100 amateur satellite transponders, which under the current proposals would be denied to British amateurs operating on the same landmass. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakava, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. The Digital Doodad Show. Hey, I like that. Maybe I'll call it that. It's time for the Digital Doodad Show. I'm your Digital Doodaddy, Leo Laporte. Time to talk about computers and the internet. So many of you, so many people suffer with internet that is not good. And it's not the problem. Now, sometimes I admit absolutely could be the problem of the internet service provider. And, and pity the poor DSL provider because they're riding on top of two little copper wires that were designed for scratchy phone 90 years ago. And the fact that they're getting any data down that pipe of any speed at all is kind of amazing. But that's DSL technology. But, you know, if you have bad wires in the house, if you have bad wires outside the house, all sorts of things can happen. It can be horribly unreliable. So, of course, if you have DSL, you know, it's hard to diagnose. All you could do is rely upon the kindness of your Internet service provider and hope that that Internet service provider is a good 
ISP and will look at the wires and, and, and say, oh, yeah, we see where the problem lies. If it lies in your house, it gets more complicated because uh, they're not really responsible for the wires in your house. In fact, you may remember when you, when you got phone service and you got DSL service, they may have offered you a in-house insurance plan, an in-house wiring insurance plan, so that you know you pay a buck a month or whatever, and they guarantee to fix the in-house wiring if there's problems, because that's a, a nightmare. And I don't know if you've ever gone outside to look at the phone block in your house and the wires coming into that, and you could see why it's amazing you're getting a megabit, let alone five or six megabits per second over that. So DSL, you know, struggles a little bit because of that distance from the office, the quality of the copper, inside and out. And then, you know, service providers vary greatly. They also vary greatly in their willingness to support it. However, if I were going to make a rule, a general rule about where internet service falls down, most of the time it's the router. And and obviously this means just more than 51% of the time or whatever, 60, probably 70% of the time. It's not all cases, but the router is one of those things people just, they think of it as an appliance, they set it, they forget it, they have it for years, they pay no attention to it. And if you, But yet, if you have discovered that internet problems can go away if you reboot the router, by the way, if you call your internet service provider, it's the first thing they'll say, reboot the router, unplug it, plug it back in, and if that fixes it, your router may be at fault. Sometimes seeing if there's new firmware and downloading it could fix it, but most of the time not. Most of the time it's just worn out. They do wear out. Uh, they get unreliable. They're cheap. And as I mentioned, you, could, you should get a much better router in general. Most people are putting up with, suffering with a bad router more often than anything else. Of course, the internet service providers kind of exacerbate the problem because they very often will give you the router with the cable modem, often in one box, which means it's not very good to begin with. And then they charge you five bucks a month for it. They rent it back and they never update it or anything. They just wait till you complain. That's why in general, what I recommend is if you must use the DSL modem provided by the provider, but not their router, use your own, go out and get your own better router, get a modern router router an a b g a c router that's your <laughs> no, it's, and this is why people don't so that the wi-fi technology is 802.11 the first one that came out was just 802.11 and then there was a i'm oh, sorry b then there was a then there was g and now it's ac those are the different standards ac is the most modern if you get an ac router it'll do all the other ones and, uh, and you're going to spend more than you think because, and by the way, I think it's worth it. You're only going to buy one of these routers every few years. And how much do you spend a month on your internet service? I mean, it, and how much of an annoyance is it when it goes out? Really annoying. You wouldn't, you wouldn't buy a water heater that only worked three hours a day. You wouldn't buy, you know, you, this is, you want, this isn't a utility. You want it to work. There are, there is a whole category of newer, very costly Wi-Fi routers that work differently than the traditional. Um, that certainly wouldn't hurt either. Get a newer modem, or uh, you know, make sure it's that your internet service provider says it's okay, and that you buy one that's on their recommended list. But often that'll help too. This new category of Wi-Fi routers do things a little differently uh, than the ASUS. Now, I'm still using, uh, I use a, I have a variety of solutions in my house because it's kind of a lab. I use the AC3200 from ASUS. It's an excellent Wi-Fi router. Kind of looks like a spider. It's uh, three bands. It's, uh, it, you know, 2.45 and 2.5 gigabit uh, bands. Very good router. Very expensive. But... Like I said, you get what you pay for. Even more expensive, though, is this new category. They're mesh routers. They work differently. In the past, if you had bad Wi-Fi connectivity as you get more distant from your access point, you would put an extender in, and Asus and Linksys and Netgear and everybody sells these. But they, they kind of work. They don't work great. 
And so, but you could you could kind of expand the footprint of your wireless access. In theory, these guys only go about 150 feet, and practice even less because there's walls and all sorts of materials in between you and your access point, and it's sometimes hard for them to get through. So an extender will help, but I'm really starting to be interested in this new category. It's unfortunately extremely pricey. Eero was the first, E-E-R-O. So you put a base station unit in, and then two satellite units. We I've found this to give me the best wireless footprint I've ever had. I mean, to the point where I could be halfway down the street and still on my Wi-Fi. Certainly covers my whole yard and the house and everything. But very, very pricey. There's some competitors coming. There's one that's delayed called Luma, L-U-M-A. I've also ordered that. I'll let you know when that comes out. And there's a newer uh, technology, won't be out till maybe Christmas, called the Plume. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week. It's different, so I'd have to test it, but it's less expensive. These guys work by creating a mesh as opposed to extending. It's a little more complicated. They also do some smart things. For instance, one of the real issues with routers is keeping it up to date, especially for security. Another reason to get rid of your old router, it's almost certainly insecure. People, you know, people like uh, the hacker the hacker group Lizard Squad uh, last Christmas used insecure routers, tens of thousands of them, to bring down the PlayStation Network and the Xbox Network uh, by just taking over people's routers. So you want a secure router. The Eero routers are updated constantly, without any of intervention on your part. They just they send you updates, which is the way it should be. So they're much more secure. They also claim they're going to update it to make it faster and more reliable as well. Be interesting to watch. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's time for this week's propagation forecast report, courtesy of Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, who reports that solar activity was way up this week, and it was reflected in on-air activity, especially on 10 meters if only the AWRL 10-meter contest were held a week later. The average daily sunspot number jumped by 100 points from 24.4 last week to 124.4 in the December 16th to the 22nd reporting week. The average planetary A index went from 5 to 9.1, and the average middle latitude A index went from 3.9 to 6.4. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux over the next week looks quite promising with daily solar flux more than 100 until the end of the year, then rising above 100 on January 16th through the 22nd. But the outlook issued on Thursday, December 23rd wasn't quite as optimistic as the one issued a day earlier. So here we go, looking at flux values, they are predicted at 130, 125, 120, 115, and 113 on December 24th through the 28th. 110 on December 29th through the 30th, 85 on December 31st, then 83, 81, 80, and 81 on January 1st through the 4th, 82 on January 5th and 6th, 83, 86, and 90, and 92 on January 7th through the 10th, 95 on January 11th and 12th, 96 on January 13th through the 15th, and jumping to 115 on January 16th and 17th. Looking at the predicted planetary A index now, it is scheduled to be 20, 12, 16, 8, 10, and 12 on December 24th through the 29th. It'll be 8 on December 30th and 31st, then 5 on January 1st through the 8th. It'll be 8 and 5 on January 9th and 10th, 10 on January 11th and 12th, 5 on January 13th and 14th, and 8, 12, 18, 12, and 8 on January 15th through the 19th. Now, with a further look forward into Solar Cycle 25, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting through the facilities of the Southgate Amateur News Service. Solar Cycle 25 is heating up. Will this new solar cycle be a wild one or a washout? Well, the online Almanac website has a few observations. Solar Cycle 25 began in December 2019 and is expected to peak in 2025, according to the Solar Cycle 25 Prediction Panel, an international group of experts co-sponsored by NASA and the NOAA. Specifically, December 2019 was the solar minimum, or the period of least solar activity in the 11-year solar cycle of the Sun. A solar cycle's highs and lows are mainly tracked by sunspots, 
dark, cool areas on the sun's surface. Sunspots release solar energy and are associated with solar flares, which are intense bursts of radiation observed near the sun's surface and in close proximity to a sunspot group. Solar flares are sometimes accompanied by coronal mass ejections, which shoot actual matter in the form of charged particles into space. If the solar eruption is particularly intense, the radiation that it releases can interfere with our radio communications here on Earth. The start of the latest solar cycle means that there will be increased activity and more sunspots until roughly mid-2025. However, the long-range prediction is that solar cycle 25 will be below average, quiet and cool. This is very similar to cycle 24, the weakest since record-keeping began in 1755. According to NOAA, NASA and international experts, cycle 25 will be similar in size to cycle 24, preceded by a long, deep minimum. Solar cycle 25 may have a slow start, but it is anticipated to peak with solar maximum occurring between 2023 and 2026 and a sunspot range of 95 to 130. But this is well below the average number of sunspots, which typically ranges from 140 to 220 sunspots per solar cycle. Solar Cycle 24 lasted for 11 years, from December 2008 until 2019, which is the average length of a cycle, though it was the weakest cycle in terms of solar activity in 100 years. Solar Maximum, or the peak of Cycle 24, was in April 2014, with sunspots peaking at 114, which is well below the average of 179. So, we wait with bated breath to see whether Cycle 25 will suddenly surprise us or just mooch into a disappointing maximum. And some of us may not be around to see whether Cycle 26 is any better. Turning our attention to this Christmas period, a large high-pressure area over Ireland has brought tropospheric propagation to VHF frequencies with early morning ducting. Good conditions, first in Spain and France, later in Central Europe, should persist for several days over the holiday. A large central coronal hole has been facing Earth. It may yet deliver the unwanted present of depressed shortwave conditions, wrapped in bright flares. Since last Thursday, the solar flux index has moved upwards of 100 again, with speeds increasing from below 400 to above 500 km per second within a few hours. This will be just right for openings in the upper bands and a sled trip through the ionosphere, but near-vertical instant skywave antenna users will find themselves surrounded by large dead zones on the low bands. Yet vertical antennas and other tall contraptions now produce reliable DX from the Pacific on 80 metres and 40 metres well into the late afternoon. Unless a coronal mass ejection conspires to depress the HF festivities, expect the daytime maximum usable frequencies to reach well above 20 MHz. This is well in line with what one can expect due to a stronger than forecast increase in solar activity, which as we've been hearing is now predicted to peak mid-2025. Comet Leonard was already visible with binoculars and small telescopes in early December, located in the early morning sky before sunrise. The comet, known as C-stroke 2021-A1, is moving into the evening sky, visible low above the southwestern horizon about an hour or so after sunset near Venus, but barely visible with the unaided eye. However, Comet Leonard is too far away to give us much needed ionisation. For that, we're going to need the Northern Lights, Elves and Sprites, and a festive spirit, all helping with the propagation and building new local and long-distance friendships. The WSJTX Development Group, Joe Taylor, K1JT, Steve Frank, K9AN, and new member Nico Palermo, IV3 and WV, has announced the release of WSJTX version 253. This new release includes a feature of special interest to users participating in the ARRL January VHF contest coming up on January 15th through the 17th, 2022. This new feature is an enhanced macro facility for text messages that is aimed at making it easier to ask another station to move to another band. This feature is described briefly in the updated WSJTX user guide. Installation packages for WSJTX version 253 
are available on the WSJTX website. It's not science fiction, but radio fact that the Manic Monkeys team of radio operators has made a 600-kilometer journey this month from Bangalore, India to Sao Jorge Island, designated as AS-177 by IOTA, activating the remote island for the first time. They've gone in search of fictional Lincoln Island that appears in Jules Verne's classic novels, but the adventuresome hams with a call sign of AT-7SJ were also in search of QSOs. Between December 3rd and December 6th, they logged 1,600 such contacts on Sideband, CW, and FT-8, while camped in difficult terrain, according to team leader Madhu Prasad, VU-3NPI. Madhu said there were other discoveries, like the island had a mysterious propagation conditions. The signals would go up and down like the tide and mysteriously close abruptly on all bands with S9 noise. Madhu said the team had been landlocked in India for two years by the pandemic and were still grieving the loss of the team's Elmer, Dev, VU2, DEV, to cardiac arrest. Now they can proudly add this uninhabited, thickly forested island to their earlier activations of St. Mary's Island, AS096, and Danushkodi Island, AS173. Madhu went on to say that the team fortunately did not find mysterious Lincoln Island nor did they locate the Aquaphone, the fictional wireless device used by Jules Verne's protagonist, Captain Nemo. They're leaving that quest and Lincoln Island for 2022. Foundations of Amateur Radio When you spend some time in this hobby, you're likely to find equipment with similar performance for vastly different pricing. At one end of the spectrum, you might compare a cheap $25 handheld radio to a $450 one. At the other end, a $1,500 SDR or software-defined radio against a $4,500 one. Those examples are for brand name devices, which generally speaking have published specifications, come with regulatory approvals, a wide user base, reviews and a distribution network. If equipment is found to be operating out of specification, a regulator might seek a remedy or ban the sale of the equipment. Those various sources and processes make it possible to compare those devices in a structured way, to discover just how deep into your pockets you need to reach in order to acquire a shiny new gadget. If you buy any of these devices in the used market, you have no way to determine just how far from the factory specifications the device you're contemplating has deviated. Is that waterproof radio still waterproof, or did the previous owner open up the case and put it together incorrectly? Was it dropped and did a component get damaged? Did the static electricity from a local thunderstorm leak through the circuit via the antenna? Or did the previous owner not use anti-static precautions when they looked inside? If it actually failed, it's easy to know. If it's still working, absent a laboratory, you're essentially on your own. If that's not challenging enough, consider hardware that's released as open source. That is, the original designer released their project, shared the design as circuit board with component list and specifications. Another person can pick up the documentation and legally build a copy of the hardware. How do you know how the two compare? Aside from considering how well any design might actually match the real world, how do you know if the original design can be improved upon or not? Did the second builder use the same components, substitute with better ones, or economize on parts they thought were too expensive? What happens if the two designers argue with each other about the performance of their respective designs? What if the second design becomes vastly more popular than the original? And what if you throw in outright intellectual property theft over the top of all this? Now consider the same physical hardware from the same factory, but using different software. How do you know what impact the software has on the performance of the equipment? For example, one component seen more and more is a chip called an FPGA, a Field Programmable Gate Array. Think of it as a programmable circuit board where updating the software creates a different circuit. An FPGA might be used to filter radio signals. With just a software update, you can program different filters and change the actual performance of the entire device. How do you know if the new version of the software has improved or worsened performance? What all this lacks is a standard way of describing performance. Not only the kind of standard that's achievable in a laboratory, but one that we can test at home. There's no documentation that I've been able to find that shows how to measure some of this objectively, or even compare your own kit against itself. 
It would be great if I could measure my gear against a standard, and you could too, and we could compare our respective equipment against each other. Even using the laboratory standard measurements, for example the Sherwood Engineering Receiver Test Data, which allows you to compare other tested equipment in the same list, is hard if not impossible to compare at home by the likes of you and I. Not to mention that Rob November Charlie Zero Bravo has finally retired after 45 years, so having been licensed in 1961 age 14, there is a good chance that updates are going to become a thing of the past when Rob stops volunteering his time. I will mention that this isn't a new thing. Many years ago I spent some time as a broadcaster. One of the very first things I was taught is that you need to set levels to trigger the VU meter just so. When you make a recording to tape, you're required to generate a 1 kHz tone at a specific level, so when it's played back to air, the voice levels will be correct. When I became licensed in 2010, I almost immediately discovered that there isn't even a standard way to test if the signal that my radio is putting into the local repeater is the same as that of other amateurs. You'll notice this because you're forever twiddling the volume on your radio when you speak with others on air, because their voice levels vary widely. One idea I've been toying with is using a parrot repeater that can measure a signal, allowing anyone who uses the same parrot to compare their equipment. How would you approach this increasingly complex problem in such a way that the amateur community can share their results in a way that makes comparison meaningful and useful? I'm Ono, a Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. In 1927, Jürgen Hals spoke to ghosts, or so it seemed. The Norwegian engineer was picking up radio signals from a Dutch shortwave transmitting station when he began to notice strange echoes of the original transmission. While echoes are nothing out of the ordinary in radio transmissions, they usually occur at about one-seventh of a second after the original transmission, because that's the amount of time it takes for a radio wave to travel once around the entire Earth. The bizarre thing about these echoes, Hals wrote in a letter to the Norwegian physicist Carl Stromer, was that they were occurring up to three seconds after the original transmission, and demonstrated a severe declension in amplitude that wouldn't have been expected if the signal had merely made several trips around the Earth. Hals didn't even attempt to explain what the signal meant. From where this echo comes from, I really can't say for the present, he wrote shortly after his discovery. I can only confirm that I really heard it. Hal's original observation of what are now known as Long Delay Echoes, or LDEs, set off a frenzied investigation into this unsettling phenomenon in the following years, although just what accounts for these echoes still remains a mystery. One of the more outlandish explanations for these echoes invokes an alien civilization trying to communicate with us. In 1960, Ronald Bracewell proposed in Nature magazine that if we were to be contacted by an autonomous, artificially intelligent alien probe, the messages we received would most likely sound like the echoes reported by Hals and Stromer in 1927, the reflection of our own radio signals back to us potentially being a highly energy efficient mode of establishing contact. This theory was later expounded upon by science fiction author Duncan Lunan in 1973, who wrote about a 13,000-year-old alien probe from the constellation Bultus hiding out in the vicinity of the Moon and echoing back our messages. Sverholm, a professor of signal processing at the University of Oslo, said that the Starship hypothesis was a very interesting one, and the one which seems to be the most popular on the Internet. He said that such theories always excite the imagination, but it builds on a very poor data set. He believed it says more about human imagination than anything else. Although scientists have yet to settle on a final explanation for these mysterious echoes, Holm believes that this has less to do with a lack of scientific knowledge, more to do with a lack of willpower. A number of more plausible explanations have been proposed in the years since Hal's initial discovery, most notably by A. G. Schleonsky in a 1989 article for the publication Telecommunications and Radio Engineering. He proposed two basic mechanisms, signals reflected from outer space and signals reflected terrestrially. In the case of space signals, there's a chance that they're being reflected back from the Moon or some of the other planets, which might account for the staggering variety in the delays. 
1946, the first signal intentionally bounced off the moon took approximately 2.5 seconds, as did signals between Houston and the Apollo 11 crew in 1969. More recently, amateur radio experimenters successfully bounced signals off the planet Venus, which resulted in a delay of about five minutes. The planet reflection hypothesis is literally quite far-fetched, said Sverholm. Communications to our nearest neighbours, Venus and Mars, take from five minutes and up to do the round trip. So with delay times in seconds or tens of seconds, this possibility can be dismissed. According to Holm, the most likely cosmic culprit accounting for long delay echoes is the collection of ionised gas clouds in Earth's Lagrange regions, which would account for echoes of between 2 and 10 seconds. Clouds of plasma are taken seriously as a possible explanation. However, one would expect frequency shifts due to relative movement as well as massive attenuation in this case, and that doesn't seem to be true. The most likely explanations for LDEs, however, are terrestrial and relatively mundane. The leading explanation attributes the echoes to a process called ducting, wherein radio signals are guided through the Earth's atmosphere. When the radio wave reaches the other side of the Earth, it is reflected off the upper ionosphere and travels back along the same path, accounting for the enhanced delay. Holmes said that he was definitely on the side of the earthbound explanations, especially the theory involving mode conversion in the ionosphere's plasma. It involves conversion from a radio wave to an acoustic-like wave, a plasma oscillation, and back again. Unfortunately for Holmes' favoured mode conversion theory, the effects are very difficult to study outside a laboratory, and no one has yet been able to explain the conditions under which it occurs in the Earth's ionosphere. Holm commented that with today's satellites and sensors, the mystery of long delay echoes could probably be solved. What's holding things back is most likely that the problem is not considered all that important, it doesn't occur often enough, and doesn't affect important enough forms of communication. Perhaps the problem will only be considered important enough when that 13,000 year old alien hiding behind the moon comes out to attack. Until then, the mystery of the ghosts in the radio waves lives on. And finally this week, NASA has announced a milestone moment in the life of the Parker Solar Probe. This year it reached the corona of the sun, a move into the solar atmosphere that is expected to yield more and more detailed insights into space weather. The U.S. Space Agency is commenting only now on the achievement which happened last spring, three years after the probe's launch, following the publication of a recent paper in the Physical Review Letter which discussed the latest chapter of the Parker probe's journey. NASA said the probe's entry into the super-hot corona meant it was flying into the eye of the storm. Once there, it studied solar wind and examined magnetic patterns known as switchbacks, which have their origins on the surface of the sun itself. The paper's lead author, Justin Casper, was quoted by National Public Radio as saying that entry into the corona lasted for several hours and was an expected and much anticipated occurrence. The probe, which is built to tolerate more than 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, is expected to re-enter the corona in January of 2022. As an aside, when the probe was being constructed three years ago, NASA invited people around the world to submit their names to fly on the mission embedded on a chip. All of us here at This Week in Amateur Radio have now had our names touch the sun. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom. The South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority. The New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the internet.
With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that This Week in Amateur Radio is produced and distributed entirely each week by our all-volunteer nonprofit organization and that we do incur expenses for its future operations. If you would like to support us, you can visit our web for all the information. Our address once again is www.twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio Headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will.